welcome to a brand new season of the Catholic novel. Today we're going to talk about Shisaku Endo's novel, Silence. And it's a very, really fitting that we start this series with that novel because just one year ago, a movie based on the novel came out. It was co-authored by Martin Scorsese and directed by Martin Scorsese. Uh, many critics consider him the number one director today. So like the novel, the film caused some controversy. I think it's a masterpiece. There are other critics who think uh, it's just not sufficiently Catholic. And I suspect those critics would make the same comment on the novel, because Scorsese is very faithful to the novel. So I think the novel is terrific, it, it, but it does raise some theological questions. Um, what's the story? Uh, the story is about uh, some young Jesuits who are very idealistic, perhaps a little bit naive, perhaps even a little bit vain. They want to go to Japan to preach Christianity. Now, this is in the early 1600s. Uh, a few years before this, everything was going very smoothly for the Jesuits in Japan. As a matter of fact, uh, San Francis Xavier made thousands, thousands and thousands of converts. But somehow the Japanese authorities uh, got the impression that the missionaries were not just preaching Christianity, but also promoting Western culture. And so a period of terrible persecution followed. And that's what these uh, young Jesuits are going to be walking into. So their superior first says that he won't let them go. But then they discuss a kind of a hero they had, a Father Ferreira. Uh, and he, there are rumors that after doing some wonderful work in Japan, he apostatized. Nobody knows whether this is true. So the young Jesuits say to the superior, look, uh, we have to follow our leader, St. Ignatius, but also we want to clear the reputation of Ferreira. And that convinces the superior to let them go. So that's the story. Um, and they do get to Japan, and they are subject to uh, uh, serious threats. You know, I, I read this novel, uh, Silence, about, it must be close to 30 years ago. And I liked it very much, but I reread it when the movie came out. And uh, I had forgotten how exciting it is. Even, even as an adventure story, it's exciting as, the, as these priests are trying to escape uh, for, you know, from the persecutors. Now, when the, to when the torture is shown in the novel and in the film, uh, I kept thinking of the Holocaust. Why? Because it's amazing to me that human beings can torture other human beings this way. It just so violates our humanity, okay? Now, what did, the, uh, what did the Japanese authorities do? Well, first of all, they crucified many. As a matter of fact, between 1614 and 1640, it's estimated that there were five or 6,000 Japanese martyrs. That's really amazing. Um, so they crucified some, and then others, they hung by their feet into a pit, and, at the, uh, and their head would go into human excrement. Uh, until they apostatized. Uh, so the, the persecutors are absolutely relentless, and they want to get the priests because they know enough about the faith to know that the Eucharist and the sacraments are the center of Catholicism. So if they can get rid of the priests, uh, they will sort of, sort of cut the branch off at its roots. And also, if they can get priests to apostatize, they will be able to say to the other Christians, well, look, don't be a fool. Of course you're going to apostatize. I mean, your leaders did, all right? So it's, it's very exciting, and it's, uh, it reminded me of Graham Greene's novel, The Power and the Glory, which we did in the earlier series of the Catholic novel. The Shisaku Endo was called the Japanese Graham Greene. Now, whether Endo intentionally modeled this novel on Greene's The Power and the Glory, I don't know. There are enough similarities uh, in the, that he may have. Uh, bo both the terrific novels. I, I think The Power and the Glory is Green's masterpiece. Um, but when, when the uh, young priests are captured, and they are eventually captured, uh, the, the main torture they have is, is knowing that other Christians are being tortured because of them. Uh, the, the young priests are quite ready to, you know, to, go, to hang upside down by their ankles and so on, but the persecutors are smart enough to know that that's not the way to get to them. That, that's making them martyrs. Uh, we want to get them, we want to, get them to, to deny Christ, okay? And so uh, you try to imagine this, that people are suffering because of you, and all you have to do is step on an image of Christ. These were called fumi, F-U-M-I-E. Step on an image of Christ, 
and this, the, the suffering will stop, and you will you will not be uh, you will not be killed. Um, you know, the novel depicts that extremely well, and Scorsese's film uh, depicts that extremely well. So, uh, in The Power and the Glory, you may remember, uh, there's a question, the priest has uh, fornicated, and he's also a whiskey priest. At the end, is he a saint, or is he a sinner? Uh, he thinks he's quite distant from God, uh, and he can't go to confession because he's the, last, he's the last priest in that country. Now, something like this is going on in this novel, too. Uh, the, the, the priest can't go to confession because he's the last priest, and he's uh, absolutely, totally upset that others are suffering because of him. But what really is the most difficult moment for him is Ferreira, his idol, had, has apostatized and is now living with the Japanese woman and the, and the Japanese women's, ch women's, women's children and writing a, a text attacking Christianity. So there's a dramatic moment in the book, and they do it very well in the film too, where the leaders bring Ferreira to, uh, Father Rodriguez is the name of the main character, they bring him to Father Rodriguez to persuade him to apostatize. And what Ferreira tries to do is to convince him that there were no real converts, that when the Japanese people said the son of God, they meant the sun, the, the sun that's millions of miles away from the earth. Uh, that it was inconceivable to them that a human being could be divine. And so the, all, the con all the conversions didn't really count at all. Now, it's not clear whether Rodriguez believes him now, but that's the first approach he takes. But then the second approach is even more, more difficult to resist. He, uh, he says, all these people are suffering because of you. And all you have to do is step on this. And by the way, when he's telling him this, there's a um, Japanese guard watching. Uh, I presume to make sure Ferreira is saying what they want him to say, and also to observe whether Rodriguez is going to give in and do this. So the guard sa has said several times in the book, look, you don't have to mean it when you apostatize. It doesn't have to be something internal. Just do what we're asking you to do. Now, why would that, why would that satisfy the J Japanese leaders, the, the officials? Because then they can, they can say, the, the priest has apostatized. Whether he did really you know, deny the faith in his mind, in his heart, that doesn't really matter. He did what they wanted him to do. He stepped on the fumi, therefore desecrating Christ. So uh, a really dramatic moment is when Ferrara tries to persuade Rodriguez to do that. And I'm going to read that section because uh, I think it's, first of all, it's extremely well written. And if you ever get to see the film, it's extremely well done. So in, this, in this, uh, these couple of paragraphs I'm going to read, uh, Ferrara is talking to Rodriguez, and the guard occasionally uh, steps in and, and says, you know, you know what's, what's the big deal? Go ahead and do it. You don't have to mean it at all, all right? The fumi is now at Rodriguez's feet. A simple copper medal is fixed onto a gray plank of dirty wood on which the grain run like little waves. Before him is the ugly face of Christ, crowned with thorns and the thin outstretched arms. Eyes dimmed and confused, the priest silently looks down at the face, which he now meets for the first time since coming to this country. Ah, says Ferrara, courage. Lord, since long ago, numerable times I have thought of your face, especially since coming to this country. Have I done so tens of times? When I was in hiding in the mountains, when I crossed over to the little ship, when I wandered in the mountains, when I lay at night quiet, whenever I prayed, your face appeared before me. When I was alone, I thought of your face. So, so there's this, uh, what should we call it? Uh, two meanings to Christ's face. Christ's face is the center of this priest's life, but also it is now the ticket to save all these people, but at the same time, to be public denying his faith. The first rays of the dawn appear. The light shines on his long neck, stretched out like a chicken, and upon the bony shoulders. The priest grasps the fumi with both hands, bringing it close to his eyes. He would like to press it to his own face, that face trampled on by so many feet. With saddened glance, he stares intently at the man in the center of the fumi worn down and hollow with the constant trampling. A tear is about to fall from his eye. 
It is only a formality, says the God. What do formalities matter? The priest t raises his foot. In it he feels a dull, heavy pain. This is no mere formality. He will now trample on what he has considered the most beautiful thing in his life, on what he has believed most pure, on what is filled with the ideals and the dreams of man. How his foot aches. And then the Christ in bronze speaks to the priest. Trample, trample. I more than anyone know of the pain in your foot. Trample. It was to be trampled on by men that I was born into this world. It was to share men's pain that I carried my cross. The priest placed his foot on the fumi. Dawn broke, and far in the distance, a cock crew. Ferrara has been telling Rodriguez, look, if Christ was here, he would step on the fumi. Let's put it in theological terms. He's telling him, if Christ was here, he would apostatize to save all of these people. Now, he's, he's telling this to Rodriguez, who already is tremendously upset by, by people suffering because of his presence. So, you know, he's been, he's been tortured, uh, he's been uh, imprisoned, and he does it. Now, of course, the question is, should he have done it? So uh, the, the, the novel raises some really good theological questions. The main problem is this. In the gospel, Jesus says, he who denies me before men, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. And so the first theological angel that comes to your mind is, it's never permissible to deny Christ. And I think that's a pretty solid you know, uh, theological opinion. However, at the way Endo paints it, the priest, Rodriguez, thinks what he is doing is right. In other words, the, the, he, Ferrari said to him, this is going to be the greatest act of love you ever perform in your life. The church won't understand you. People won't understand you. You'll be mocked. You'll be disowned. But this is what love does, okay? So the, Endo does a terrific job of writing this, and I think Scorsese in the movie did a terrific, did a terrific job of, uh, of expressing this. Uh, later in the novel and in, in the movie, there is a clear indication that Rodriguez did not uh, mean the apostatizing. In other words, he, re he really did not deny the faith in his mind, in his heart. Now, is that good enough? Uh, th they express that in one way in the novel, and Scorsese, in my opinion, comes up with a brilliant way in the movie of doing it. But it, obviously, the, the, the novel and the movie are both saying that this, this man is still in union with Christ, okay? Now, if, if you read the novel or if you see the movie, it's up to you to figure it out. Uh, I don't know whether, I, I think even those who don't agree with the theology think it's a terrific novel and it's a terrific movie. I would like to make one other point. Suppose we, we say objectively, Rodriguez shouldn't have done it. But in the story, he thinks He's doing the right thing. Of course, it's not, it's not crystal clear to him, okay? But he, this is what he thinks. Um, and even if, even if that's the interpretation you give, that he thinks he's innocent, but he isn't, it's still a terrific novel. So I, I recommend you reading this one very much. Uh, Endo really deserves the title, The Japanese Graham Greene. So if you've read The Power and the Glory, in your own mind, just compare and contrast the two. <laughs>